فاشرف بي لاشتغال بالعلم ولا تبغي به ما عشت يا ذا بدلا ويا له من شرف عظيم section section it is recommended that any reciter whether in prayers or outside of that say amin after reciting al fatiha there are many well known authentic hadith that illustrate this the author here, rahimahullah, he talks about the meanings and the ahkams pertaining to Ameen. He says, It is recommended for every reciter in the prayer, or other than the prayer, if he finishes reciting Surah Al Fatiha, that he says, Ameen. And the ahadiths pertaining to this are well known and are famous. We have already mentioned that it is recommended to separate between the end of Al-Fatiha and saying Ameen with a slight silence. And we've already spoke, this is something that we spoke about in the previous fasl, which is that it's recommended between your Ameen and your Fatiha, there's a slight silence, he says. And we said that the evidence for this, it's a hadith narrated by who? Samurat ibn Jundubin, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, which is narrated by Abu Dawood and At-Tirmidhi. Naam. The word Amin means oh Allah. Now the author is going to go into speaking about the meanings that Amin hold and what it's, and what are its meanings. So he mentions the word Amin means oh Allah. Answer. So the first meaning he mentions is that Allahumma ya Allah istajib. Oh Allah, obey. Now. It's also been said that it means the following. Let it be. Also, some of the meanings that some scholars said it, is, it means كَذَلِكَ فَلْيَكُنْ Let it be like this, O oh Allah. Naam. And do. And some of the scholars said the meaning is do this, O oh Allah. And no one is able to do this except you. And the other meaning that some scholars mentioned is لَا يَقْدِرُ عَلَى هَذَا أَحَدٌ سِوَاكَ No one else is able to do this except, except you, O oh Allah. And don't leave us to despair. And the next meaning that some of the scholars mentioned, which is, لا تخيب أو الله سبحانه وتعالى Don't dis... Don't... Huh? Don't, leave us to despair. No, don't lead us to despair. Your hope. رجاء أنا فيك. The hope that we have in you. And what? give us security with goodness. And also some of the scholars, they said, اللهم آمنا بخير أو الله Give us security with your good, أو الله. Others have stated that it is a seal that Allah places upon his servants to guard them against harm. So some scholars, they said, this is a tabi'ah. It's a seal Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed upon his slaves. يَدْفَعُ بِهِ عَنْهُمُ الْآفَاتِ Which through it, Allah will repel from you any calamities that befall you. Now. And some have said that it is a rank in paradise reserved by those who utter it. And another scholars, group of scholars, they said, the meaning it holds is that the Amin is actually a position in Jannah. It's a place and a level in Jannah, which those who say it are in deserving of it. Others still have said that it is one of the names of Allah, but researchers and the majority of scholars have refuted this claim. Some scholars, they said, Amin is ismu min asma'illahi ta'ala. It's a name from the names of Allah. Like in the muhaqqiqoon, the scholars who are grounded and well-rooted, and the majority of the scholars, they've actually rejected that view, and they did not take that into consideration. It is also said that it is a Hebrew word that was Arabized. Some scholars, they said, it's a ismu ibrani. It's a Hebrew word. And then it became Arabic. So that would mean then that the Quran, that would mean, sorry, a person is speaking in the Quran in other than the Arabic language. And that's a weak view, right? Yeah? Abu Bakr al Waraf's opinion is that it is something said to fortify one's supplication and so that Allah's mercy may descend upon those saying it. Abu Bakr, ibn, Abu Bakr al Waraf, he says that Amin is actually quwwatun lid dua. It's actually to force is to actually strengthen and uh, strength, yeah, strengthen the dua that you've made and and it's also requesting for Allah's mercy to descend on you and others have said other than that so these are the general meanings that have scholars have, have tried to push forward that it means Amin means and there are other possible explanations for the word Naam. so now we know that we have an overview or a general understanding of what Amin means okay no. There are different ways of pronouncing Amin. So how do we read Amin? The author mentions four ways, inshallah, that the scholars read it. 
And they are as follows. And they are the, these are the four that we're going to see. The first one is. Why? Do you want to say? So the first one is Amin. By elongating the A, the scholars have stated that this is the most correct method of pronunciation. So what do you do? You place a med. You place a med. You lengthen the utterance of the alif. So you say Amin. Or Amin. So that's the first one, which is med. And the takhfif of the meme. The meme is read low, it's not read loud, it's not sorry, it's not lengthened. Are you? Number two is. Then number two is. Ameen. By not elongating the a. So you don't lengthen the a. Number three. Those are the two. Wahatani, lugatani, mashwuratani. The two that I just mentioned right now, which is. Ameen. And. Amin is both Lugatan and Mashwuratan. They are two languages within the Arabs that are well known. So there's no big problem with those two. They, they well, that's well known. And the third. Fadal, you say it first. It says that by pronouncing the uh, as midway between an A and an E. So, yeah, so the person says, he didn't say A uh, and he didn't say E. E, he says E. Uh, which is called Imala, and it's the one. وَقَالَ رَكَبُوا فِيهَا بِسْمِ اللَّهِ مَجْرِيهَا مَجْرِيهَا It's called Imala. In Qira'a, it's called what? وَقَالَ What was the ayah read? وَقَالَ رَكَبُوا فِيهَا بِسْمِ اللَّهِ مَجْرِيهَا مَجْرِيهَا That's Imala. That is called Imala. So you don't say as a Fatha nor a Kasra. It's a way in between. Al-Wahid is transmitted this from Hamza al-Kisai, who are Qurra. Yeah? Al-Wahid narrated this pronunciation from Hamza al-Kisai. And the fourth? The fourth one is, the person says, Amin. So he places a Shadda on the Mim, with a Mad on the Alif. By innovating both the A and the Mim. Yeah. This pronunciation was narrated by Al Wahidi from Al Hassan and Al Hussein ibn Al Fadl. Al Wahidi also stated that this narration is further corroborated by a report from Jafar Sadiq, who said that this means we come to you, and you are more generous than to turn away he who comes to you. No. This fourth pronunciation is very peculiar and has been considered by some linguists to be a mistake made by the common folk. This one, the fourth one, which is Tashdeedu al Mimi Ma'al Maddi. Tashdeedu. Tashdeed al Mimi Ma'al Maddi. This one, um, the Shaykh Rahimullah, as now we mentioned, this is Gharib Jiddal. So, this is strange. And it's something that the scholars of the Arabic language, they considered it to be what? Lahn al Awam. It is a fault and an error that has come from the general folks, the general mass. Okay. Mm-hmm. Indeed, some Shafi'i scholars have even said that pronouncing it in this manner during prayer invalidates the prayer. Some of the Shafi'i, they even said, Man qalaha fi salati, anyone who says like that, which is bitashdeed al mimi, ma'al maddi, they said, patalat salat wi salat is actually null and void. But you have to understand that the statement of Nawi here, laysa ala itlaqiha, it's not unrestrictedly. Shafi'i have placed a tafsil on this issue. Look at the tuhfat al muhtaj by Ibn Hajar rahimahullah ta'ala. Arabic language scholars have stated that a person saying the word Amin is to stop at the end of it. But if one desires to connect it to the following word, he should pronounce it Amina in the same way one says Kaifa and Aina and not say Amini. Now, so if the person wants to connect Amin with the next surah that he's going to read, then he should make a Fatha on the, the Noon. So it should be Amina. You can't say Amini. Does it make sense? Just like you say Aina and Kaifa. But you don't say Amini. No, it's incorrect. As Amini is heavier to pronounce phonetically. Normally, what happens? Iltiqa Isakinain happens. What do you do? You generally resort to making it a Kasra. Here, say because it's Mimbabi Thiqal, it's heaviness. You should just say Amina. Yeah? 
This is a summary of that which relates to the word Amin, and I have added more opinions, statements, and proofs regarding this word in the book, Tahdeeb al Asma wal Lughat. You find this in his third, third volume. The Kitab al Asma wal Lughat is owned by Al Azhari originally. It's originally owned by Al Azhari. What he did was Al Imam al Nawi summarized it and worked on the book. So in the third volume, he speaks about it in details there. Now, the scholars have stated that saying Amin is recommended for the Imam, those being led in prayer, and one praying alone. It's also recommended that the Imam and one praying alone say it aloud in prayers where the recitation is also recited aloud. The scholars, however, have disagreed with regards to whether those being led in prayer should say Amin aloud. The first of the opinions on this issue is that they should say Amin aloud, and this is the correct view. Mm -hmm. A second opinion is that they should whisper it, and that the third opinion states it should be said aloud in the presence of a large number of people, otherwise it should be whispered. So the issue of Amin, the Hanaf, the Masajid that you go to the Hanaf, what did they say? They don't say it, right? So when you go to, <coughs> they don't say Amin, they're quiet. We say it like it, sah? The Shafi'i and others, they say it. The Jumhur, they say it. So there are different opinions. The strongest is that you say it loudly, Amin. Annahu yajharu. Those being led in prayer should say Amin to coincide with the moment when that the Imam says it. And when do you say it? You say it with the Imam. Don't say it before the Imam, for sure. And it's not one of those things that you say after the Imam. Generally, the Ma'moom has to follow the Imam, right? But when it comes to the uh, Amin, it's the only thing that he has to do with the Imam. He has to do with the Imam. Based on the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, which we're going to see. And neither before nor after that. Hmm. This is due to an authentic hadith where the Prophet ﷺ says, when the Imam says, Law of those who went astray, say Amin. And whosoever says Amin at the moment the angel says it, will have his past sins forgiven. Sahih. As for the authentic hadith where the Prophet وسلم, says, when the Imam says Ameen, then say Ameen, this should be taken to mean when the Imam intends to say Ameen. Sahih. So when, it, when the Imam says Ameen, say Ameen, means when he intends to say Ameen, say Ameen. So in other words, say it with him, not after he has said it. Naam. Our companions have stated that there is no other time during prayer where it is recommended for those led in prayer to say what the Imam says at the same time that he says it, except to say Ameen, anything else should be said after the Imam. So generally speaking, the qa'idah, the generic principle is that the ma'moom, the one who is praying with the Imam, should follow the Imam, whether it be speech or actions. The only time in which he has to do something with the Imam or he's allowed to do something with the Imam is when it comes to Ameen. He's Ameen and the Ameen of the of the Imam and the angels, if they are in uh, correlation, if they, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive. Faslun fi sujood tilawa. I read it, hey? Section, frustration of recitation. Now we're going to be speaking about the ruling pertaining to sujood tilawa. Sujood tilawa means what? The prostration of recitation. When you recite the Quran, there are verses when you come to that. It's a verse of prostration. It's called a verse of what? Prostration. Naam. So this is the ruling we're going to be speaking about here. This is another matter that deserves attention. So it's something, it's another matter that should be spoken about and dealt with. While the scholars have agreed that prostrating upon reciting is something Muslims have been directed to do, they disagree as to whether it's compulsory or merely recommended. Why do you just lock her in her chair? She's rubbing people's bags, saying Ameen all day, like she's praying. Wallahi, she's making me confused. Lock her up, lock her up, lock her up. She's not behaving herself today. Sorry, I can go back. This is another matter that deserves attention. While the scholars have agreed that prostrating upon reciting is something Muslims have been directed to do, they disagree as to whether it is compulsory or merely recommended. So the issue of sujood tilawa, is it obligatory or is it recommended? Sujood tilawa, is it wajib or is it istihbab, is it recommended? The scholars have differed upon this issue. The author is going to go into this issue right now. 
The majority of the scholars are of the opinion that it is not compulsory and that rather it is only recommended. So this is the view of the Jamahir al-Ulama. The majority of the scholars, they hold the opinion that Laysa bi wajib that it's not wajib, bal huwa mustahabun that is recommended. This is the opinion of Umar ibn Khattab, Ibn Abbas, Salman al-Farisi, Imran ibn Hussain, Imam Malik, Fawzari, Imam Shafi'i, Ahmed, Ishaq, Abi Thawm, Darud, and others may have mercy on them this is, the view that, this is the view that they hold, which is that it is a uh, mustahab, that is recommended, that it's not wajib. Umar ibn al-Khattab held that view. Abdullah ibn Abbas held that view that it's recommended. Salman al-Farisi held that view that it's recommended. Imran ibn al-Husayn held that view that it was recommended. And Imam Malik held the view that it was recommended. And Imam al-Awza'i held the opinion that it was recommended. Shafi'i also. Ahmed as well, Ishaq as well, Abi Thawr, Dawood, and other than them, they all held the opinion that it's recommended and that it's not obligatory. So this is the view of the overwhelming majority of scholars. And then? Imam Abu Hanifa, however, held the opinion that it is compulsory and derived proof for this verdict from the verse, what is the matter with them that they do not believe? And when the Quran is recited, and when the Quran is recited to them, they fall not in prostration to their Lord. Abu Hanifa radiallahu anhu, may Allah bestow his never-ending mercy onto this great Imam. He held the opinion that it's not wajib. Sorry, sorry, he held the opinion that it is wajib and that it's obligatory. That when you come on a verse, which is a verse of recitation, that you have to prostrate. This is the view held by who? Abu Hanifa. And Abu Hanifa rahimahullah, he used as evidence the statement of Allah, فَمَا لَهُمْ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ Why is it that they don't believe? وَإِذَا قُرِئَ عَلَيْهِمُ الْقُرْآنِ When the Qur'an is read on them, لا يَسْجُدُونَ They don't prostrate. How is it? They don't, they don't prostrate. So he used this verse, but this verse is not a evidence for him to be honest. Because after that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, in, in that same verse, what does Allah say? بَلِ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا يُكَذِّبُونَ صح? Because the ones who was prostrating, refusing to prostrate for this verse, they were refusing to prostrate from the angle of disbelief of it. Not that they didn't want to prostrate because they didn't see obligatory, that's a different thing. It was out of what? Tark is to do takdeeban, out of disbelief of it. So this is, is an ayah that's not evidence for him in this regard. And nobody's going to respond to him. And Imam Nawi is going to respond to him. The majority of scholars, on the other hand, took as evidence for the view that it is not compulsory a report that Khalid bin Khattab recited Surah al Nahl on the pulpit on Friday until he reached the verse of prostration, whereupon he descended and prostrated, and the people prostrated with him. On the following Friday, he recited the same chapter until he reached the same verse and then said, O oh people, we will only read. The prostration this time and so whoever prostrates will be rewarded but those who do not prostrate will not be committing a sin and on this occasion he did not prostrate here there's a mas'ala that's muhim jidda lil ghaya it's a mas'ala which is very important and that is the fi'l sahaba the sahaba's understanding is very important umar radiallahu anhu what he did was he stood up on the pulpit so he led salatul jum'ah so he read the khutbatul jum'ah sorry and he read suratul nahl he came to the ayah of what? The verse of what? The verse of prostration. When he came the first khutbah, Umar radiallahu anhu, he prostrated. You see, he prostrated. Qara'a yawm al-jum'ati ala al-manbar. He read on the pulpit on Friday, Surah al-Nahli. Hatta idha kana sajda, until he came to the verse of prostration, fasajada wa sajada al-nasu. He prostrated and the people prostrated with him. Hatta idha kana til jum'ati al-qabila. Then the next Friday came. He read the same surah. When he came to the verse of prostration, Umar said to the people, Ya ayyuhal nas, O people, inna ma namurru bi sujood. We're going to go over the verse of prostration. We're just going to go over it. فَمَنْ سَجِدَ فَقَدْ أَصَابْ Any one of you who prostrated, he has done good. وَمَنْ لَمْ يَسْجُدْ As for the one who doesn't prostrate, فَلَا إِثْمَ عَلَيْهِ There is no sin on him. وَلَمْ يَسْجُدْ عُمَرُ بْنُ الْخَطَّابِ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُ And Umar is didn't do sujood himself. So why did Umar do this? He was trying to teach the people that it's not obligatory to do sujood on the sujood of tilawah. That it's not obligatory. 
So Umar did two things here. He done a speech and, he sp and an action. So this is what Nawi tried to use for his view, that the, the view that held by the Jamahir al ulama the majority of the scholars held. Naam. Umar's action is clear proof that it is not compulsory. And the verse referred to by Abu Hanifa is a condemnation of those who refuse to prostrate due to their rejection of faith. Sah. This is why Allah says after this verse, those who disbelieve persist in rejecting the truth. So this is the ayah. This context restricts the meaning. So the ayah that Abu Hanifa used is talking about a people who refuse to prostrate from the angle of disbelief of this disbelief uh, of the prostration. Not those who refuse to, I mean those who don't prostrate uh, because they don't see it to be obligatory. Additionally, <coughs> additionally it's reported in the two authentic books so here we have in Sahihain, we have in Bukhari and what? We have in Bukhari and Muslim. What do we have in Bukhari and Muslim? We have that. Zayd ibn Thabit, he read on the Prophet Sallallahu Surah Al-Najm. You see, and he came to the verse of Sajdah and he did a prostrate. And the Prophet didn't say to him, you have to prostrate. And also it's, in, it's transmitted in Bukhari and Muslim that he Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he prostrated uh, in a Najm. So the Prophet prostrated, whereas Zayd did a prostrate. That shows you the permissibility that the person can prostrate and another one chooses not to prostrate. It's not obligatory. You know, everybody, everybody doesn't have to prostrate. Also, some scholars they say to you that if the reciter doesn't prostrate, you're not allowed, you're not allowed to prostrate. And if he prostrates, you have to prostrate. That's also incorrect. Because when Umar read on the pulpit, Surah Al Nahal, he said to those who prostrated, فَمَنْ سَجَدَ فَقَدْ أَصَابَ The ones who prostrated got it right. وَمَنْ لَمْ يَسْجُدْ فَلَا إِثْمَ عَلَيْهِ And the hadith of Zayd ibn Thabit here, Zayd didn't do prostration but the Prophet did. So it shows you that the reciter and the one who is listening can both do different actions. And no one can make it obligatory on one and not the other. <coughs> فصل في بيان عدد السجدات ومحلها ما عددها فالمختار الذي قاله الشافعي والجماهير أنها أربع عشرة سجدة سجدة في العراف والرعد والنحل وسبحانه ومريم وفي الحج سجتان وفي الفرقان والنمل وآل ولطال فلاميم تنزيل وحاميم سجدة والنجم وإذا السماء انشقت وقرأ باسم باسم ربك وأما السجدة صاد فمستحبة وليست من عزائم السجود أي متأكداته ثبت في صحيح البخاري عن ابن عباس رضي الله عنهما قال صاد ليست من عزائم السجود وقد رأيت النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يسجد فيها هذا مذهب الشافعي ومن قال مثله وقال أبو حنيفة هي أربع عشرة سجدة أيضا ولكن أسقط الثانية من الحج وأثبت سجد صاد وجعلها من العزائم وعن أحمد روايتان إحداهما كما قال الشافعي والثانية خمس عشرة سجدة زاد صاد وهو قول أبي العباس بن السريج وأبي إسحاق المروزي من أصحاب الشافعي رضي الله عنهم وعن مالك, مالك روايتان إحداهما كالشافعي وأشهرهما إحدى عشرة أسقط الثانية في الحج والنجم وإذا السماء انشقت وقرأ وهو قول قديم للشافعي والصحيح ما قدمناه والأحاديث الصحيحة تدل عليه وأما محلها فسجدة الأعراف 
في آخرها والرعد عقيب قوله تعالى بالغدو والآصال والنحل ويفعلون ما يمرون وفي السبحان ويزيدهم خشوعا وفي مريم خروا سجدا وبكيا والأولى من سجدتي الحج إن الله يفعل ما يشاء والثانية وافعلوا الخير لعلكم تفلحون والفرقان وزادهم نفورا والنمل رب العرش العظيم ألف لام ميم تنزيل وهم لا يستكبرون وحاميم وهم لا يسأمون والنجم في آخرها وإذا السماء شقت لا يسجدون وقرأ في آخرها ولا خلاف يعتد به في شيء من مواضع من مواضعها التي من مواضعها إلا التي في حاميم فإن العلماء اختلفوا فيها فذهب الشافعي رضي الله عنه وأصحابه إلى ما ذكرنا أنها عقي أنها عقي أنها عقيب أنها عقيب لا يسأمون وهذا مذهب سعيد بن المسيب ومحمد بن سيرين وأبي وائل شقيق بن سلمة وسفيان الثوري وأبي حنيفة وأحمد وإسحاق بن راهوية وذهب آخرون إلى أنها عقيب قوله تعالى إن كنتم إياه تعبدون حكاه ابن المذر عن عمر بن الخطاب رضي الله عنه والحسن البصري وأصحاب عبد الله بن مسعود وإبراهيم النقعي وأبي صالح وطلحة بن مصرف والزبيد بن الحارث ومالك بن أنس والنيث بن سعد ووجه لبعض أصحاب الشافعي حكاه البغوي في التهذيب وأما قول أبي الحسن علي بن سعيد العبدري من أصحابنا في كتاب الكفاية في اختلاف الفقهاء عندنا أن سجدة النمل عند قوله تعالى ويعلم ما تخفون وما تعلنون قال وهذا مذاب أكثر الفقهاء وقال مالك هي عند قوله تعالى رب العرش العظيم فهذا الذي نقله عن مذهبنا ومذهب أكثر الفقهاء غير معروف غير معروف ولا مقبول بل غلط, بل غلط ظاهر وهذه كتب أصحابنا مصرحة بأنها, بأنها عند قوله تعالى رب العرش العظيم We'll conclude إن شاء الله تعالى We'll do that part uh, tomorrow إن شاء الله تعالى uh, سبحانك اللهم بحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله استغفرك وأتوب إليك